Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, who in thy wisdom and goodness has appointed the office of rulers and parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of men, we beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants, whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of important trust in these islands. Let thy blessing descend upon us here assembled, and grant that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner, and to promote thy honor and glory, and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of these islands, and of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Good morning, members. Confirmation of minutes. Members, the minutes of the 12th of July have been circulated. Are there any omissions or corrections that, need, that are required? There are none. The minutes are confirmed as printed. Announcements by the Speaker? Governor. Uh, message from Governor, none. Um. Speaker's, speaker's announcements. We have this morning the first announced members who are absent. We received communications from the Minister Keynes, from Member Weeks, Member Monis and Member Ben Smith, that they'll be absent today. And a reminder that MP Scott Simmons is still at the 44th Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Conference on behalf of our Parliament, so he'll be absent as well. Also, I'd like to note that on your desk, you should have an invitation from the future leaders. The future leaders' induction and closing ceremony is actually this afternoon at 5. 15, and they have extended the invitation to members of Parliament to be present. This is the conclusion of the three-week academic component of the program. Students will share their experiences to showcase their accomplishments and be inducted as future leaders, and you're invited um, to be present if possible. If possible. That's it. Oh, sorry. And also, um, let me also acknowledge our youth parliament and that the youth parliamentarians were also attending the regional conference in Trinidad. It's the 15th regional youth parliament debate. And Ms. Chris, how she, Chris, Crystal Smith and Mrs. Haley Tiara. Tiara. And Ms. Tiara was awarded the best debater of the competition, and we'd just like to uh, officially recognize that and congratulate her and the entire Youth Parliament team that were present, both her and uh, Ms. Smith, for representing Bermuda at the, annu at the an 15th Annual um, Youth Parliament debate that took place in Trinidad and Tobago. And we'd, on that note, we'd like to welcome the deputy back. Um, the deputy, as you know, had been there, and he came back late last night to be present today. But it's just informing that that is Ms. our former Speaker Lewis' granddaughter. Yes. Oh, so it was running the family then. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Messages from the Senate. There are none. Papers and other communications through the House. There are none. Petitions. There are none. Statements by ministers. There is... There are actually four statements this morning. 
And the first is in the name of the Minister Fogo. Minister Fogo. Good morning to the House. Good morning to the, our listeners. And, and especially good morning to all of those who say support the East. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to advise my colleagues in this honorable house of events taking place this month to recognize the 185th anniversary of the abolition of slavery in Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, the history of Bermudians of African descent did not begin with slavery and did not end with slavery. Thus, the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs Emancipation Committee has over the years centered its program offerings on educating our people not only about the important history of resistance to slavery, such as the conspiracy of 1761, the trial of Sally Bassett, and the poisoning conspiracies of the late 1720s, but also on our history before slavery, including research by Boston University professors, Drs. Thornton and Haywood, indicating the Anglican roots of the original African Bermudian population, as well as the post-emancipation contributions of black Bermudians, including the role of our friendly societies, the significance of black entrepreneurship, and the five-year tra trail of our program that charted the contributions of unsung champions who supported the black community through the post-abolition and segregation eras. There's a long and rich history that we pull from, and these are the stories that Bermudians need to know and claim as a way of bolstering a sense of national pride, identity, and purpose. Mr. Speaker, this year's commemorations focus on the legacy of Mary Prince, who is not only a Bermuda national hero, but who was also an internationally recognized abolitionist whose narrative provided a clarion call for the emancipation of all those held captive under the inhumane practices of chattel, sorry, chattel slavery throughout the British Empire. Her slave narrative, The History of Mary Prince, does not document a benign life as a slave in Bermuda. <coughs> and I'm provi providing today all members of this honorable house with a copy of her book as essential reading. Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to read a few paragraphs of her experiences to highlight that there was nothing benign about slavery in Bermuda. With your permission, Mr. Speaker? Yes. Thank you. I got a sad fright that night. I was just going to sleep when I heard a noise in my mistress's room, and she presently called out to inquire if some work was finished that she had ordered Hetty to do. No, ma'am, not yet, was Hetty's answer from below. On hearing this, my master started up from his bed, and just as he was in his shirt, ran downstairs with a long cow skin in his hand. I heard immediately after the cracking of the thong and the house rang to the shrieks of poor Hetty, who kept crying out, Oh, Massa, Massa, me dead, Massa, have mercy upon me. Don't kill me outright. This was a sad beginning for me. I sat up upon my blanket, trembling with terror like a frightened hound, and thinking that my turn would come next. At length, the house became still, and I forgot for a little while all my sorrows by falling asleep. The next morning, my mistress sat about instructing me in my tasks. She taught me to do all sorts of household works, to wash and bake, pick cotton and wool, wash floors and cook, and she taught me, how can I ever forget it, 
more things than these. She caused me to know the exact difference between the smart of the rope, the cart whip, and the cow skin when applied to my naked body by her own cruel hand. And there was scarcely any punishment more dreadful than the blows I received on my face and head from her hard, heavy fist. She was a fearful woman and a savage mistress to her slaves. Thank you. Not quite finished. Poor Hattie, my fellow slave, was very kind to me, and I used to call her my aunt, but she led a most miserable life, and her death was hastened. At least the slaves all believed and said so by the dreadful chastisement she received from my master during her pregnancy. It happened as follows. One of the cows had dragged the rope away from the stake to which Hetty had fastened it and got loose. My master flew into a terrible passion and ordered the poor creature to be stripped quite naked, notwithstanding her pregnancy, and to be tied up to a tree in the yard. He then flogged her as hard as he could lick, both with the whip and cow skin, till she was all over streaming with blood. He rested and then beat her again and again. Her shrieks were terrible. The consequence was that poor Hetty was brought to bed before her time and was delivered after severe labor of a dead child. She appeared to recover after her confinement so far that she was repeatedly flogged by both master and mistress afterwards, but her former strength never returned to her. Ere long her body and limbs swelled to a great size, and she lay on the mat in the kitchen till the water burst out of her body, and she died. All the slaves said that death was a good thing for poor Hattie, but I cried very much for her death. The manner of it filled me with horror. I could not bear to think about it. Yet, it was always present to my mind for many a day. Mr. Speaker, that was just read to let people know the atrocities of slavery. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs has partnered with Titan Express to offer a historical bus tour providing highlights of Mary Prince's autobiography, visiting three of the sites that she mentioned in her books. This tour is running throughout the month of July, and as it stands, those tours are already sold out. So we, we have put on four more tours for the month of August. We congratulate Rashida Godwin and her team at Titan Express for developing this kind of offering. Given the level of public interest and value to cultural tourism, we thank Titan for considering the extension of the tours into August and hopefully throughout the year. Mr. Speaker, part of the history of black Bermudians has been about recognizing our connection to those throughout the African diaspora. This connection has perhaps been most clear to our historians and artists. The Dr. Kennedy Robinson Cyril Outerbridge Packlet Memorial Lecture honoring two of our most insightful historians has now entered its 14th year. And Tuesday night featured a talk on the African-American poet Langston Hughes. The talk offered by Stanford University Professor Amaritas Dr. Arnold Rampasad was followed by a second lecture last night by Dr. Rampasad entitled Writing Our Lives, focusing on the importance of autobiography, memoir, and biography, Mary Prince's narrative being a key example. Mr. Speaker, the events relating to the Emancipation Committee are important, but what might sometimes be overlooked is the vital research that the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs funds so that we might know more about the depth and breadth of our history. In 2017-18, the department funded a research project by Dr. Margot Madison McFadden on the latter days of Mary Prince. Since, as vital as Prince's story is to our national narrative, we have had little information about what happened to our hero following the publication of her book. 
Mr. Speaker, these findings, which have already been shared with a number of schools during Education Month in February, will now be made known to the public in a lecture by Dr. Madison McFadden on July 25th at the Earl Cameron Theater. Let me just mention that that is a free lecture, Mr. Speaker. This talk will conclude with a dance performance entitled A Woman Named Prince, choreographed by Conchita Ming, performed by Ariel Lee Ming and the Anointed Wings of Fire. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs, as well as the individuals who comprise the Emancipation Advisory Committee, are to be commended for these excellent offerings. It is my hope that these events will strengthen our understanding of who we are, where we come from, and the strength of the shoulders that we all stand upon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The next statement is in the name of the Minister of Education. Minister. Good morning, Mr. The Speaker. The copies are being distributed now. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, good morning to the general public and good morning, colleagues. Mr. Speaker, this morning I rise to share with this honorable house the, recip the recipients of the Ministry of Education's 2019 scholarships and awards. On Wednesday this week, July 17th, the Ministry of Education held its annual scholarships and awards reception, which was a gratifying evening of recognition and celebration of an outstanding group of young Bermudians. The reception brought together over 100 family members and friends who demonstrated a high degree of pride in their clapping, whistling, and shout-outs as each student was called to receive their scholarship or and award. Although this year's scholarships and awards recipients reflected different ages, backgrounds, and areas of study, a common thread was revealed in their expression of deep commitment to achieve, be successful, and contribute towards a better Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, this government shares that same commitment. We not only value education, but are investing in education. We are delivering on our pledge to provide, a greater, to provide greater opportunities for Bermudians to help meet their individual education and training needs, but also for those of our community and economy. We believe that funds for post-secondary education and training be used strategically and in line with our values. Therefore, in putting our children and their futures first, we continue to provide long-standing scholarships and awards, such as the Bermuda Government Scholarships for Outstanding Scholars, the Further Education Awards for students who need financial support in completing college or university, and more recently, the Technical and Vocational Awards, Applied Technology Scholarships, and Awards for Exceptional Students. Mr. Speaker, let me share first the names of the recipients of the prestigious Bermuda Government Scholarship Award. The Scholarships and Awards Committee of the Board of Education identified the most qualified students who were well-rounded by way of demonstrating outstanding academic achievement, leadership, community service, and a commitment to contribute to Bermuda upon the completion of their studies. Each Bermuda Government Scholarship recipient receives funding towards the cost of tuition and accommodation up to $35,000 per annum for a period of up to four years. Mr. Speaker, these high-achieving students emanate from the Bermuda's public and private educational institutions. These students are pursuing fields of medicine, law, and psychology. Mr. Speaker, the 2019 Bermuda Government Scholarship Awardees are Taj Donville Otterbridge, a graduate of the Barclay Institute and the Bermuda College Dual Enrollment Program. He is pursuing a degree in medicine at St. John's University in Grenada. Ryan Robinson Perenchi, a graduate of the Barclay Institute and an LLB graduate of Durham University. He will be completing his legal practice course at BPP University in the UK. And the third awardee is Harley Purvey, a graduate of the Bermuda High School for Girls. She will be pursuing a degree in psychology at McMaster's University, Ontario, Canada, with a focus on speech language pathology. Mr. Speaker, we are pleased that our top Scholarship recipients are pursuing areas of study that are relevant for Bermuda and in industries that require Bermudian professionals. Mr. Speaker, as a reminder to my honorable colleagues, the next set of scholarships and awards were introduced to ensure more diversity in our awards funding. There are a total of five categories, which include the Minister's Achievement Scholarship for a graduating student from Cedar Bridge Academy and a graduating student from the Barclay Institute to pursue overseas post-secondary study the Minister's Technical and Vocational Award for graduating public school students or recent public school alumni attending Bermuda College 
who are pursuing local or overseas post-secondary study. The minister's exceptional student award for graduating students or school leavers with disabilities pursuing local or overseas post-secondary study. The minister's applied technology scholarship for senior public school dual enrollment students in the Bermuda College's applied technology program to allow recipients to complete their associate's degree once they have graduated from senior school and the Minister's Bermuda College Book Award for the purchase of books by Bermuda College students in financial need. These scholarships and awards are tenable for the duration of the student's full-time post-secondary program of study for a period from one to four years, except the Minister's, college, the minister's Bermuda College Book Award, which is a one-time award valued at $500 for the purchase of books. All other Minister's scholarships and awards are valued at $5,000 for local studies and $25,000 for overseas studies. Mr. Speaker, recipients of the Minister's Applied Tech Scholarships are Malachi Butterfield. He is, pursue, he is a graduate of Cedarbridge Academy. In September 2019, he will pursue associate's degree at the Bermuda College on his path to becoming a robotics engineer. Kunde Tuzo, another graduate of Cedarbridge Academy. He will pursue an associate's degree at Bermuda College. His goal is to become a veterinarian technician. I'm most pleased to add that both students are recent graduates of the Applied Technology Certificate Program offered at the Bermuda College. Mr. Speaker, recipients of the Minister's Achievement Scholarship are Jordan Richardson, a 2019 graduate of the Barclay Institute. She plans to study psychology and neuroscience at Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. And Marley Hines, a 2019 graduate of Cedarbridge Academy. He plans to study economics at Bryant University in Smithfield, Rhode Island. Also, let me state that both students are recent graduates of the Bermuda College dual enrollment program as well. Mr. Speaker, recipients of the Minister's Technical and Vocational Awards are Demetrius Richardson, a graduate of the Barclay Institute. He has been accepted to the International Liverpool College to pursue the foundation, foundation Certificate for Business Law and Social Studies. Upon completion, he will enter a BA Honors in Architecture at the University of Liverpool. Jamori Richardson, a graduate of Cedarbridge Academy. He has been accepted into Bermuda College and, and will pursue an Associate of Science in Computer Information Systems. Mr. Speaker, the recipients of the Minister's Exceptional Student Awards are Calvin Rayner. He attended Bermuda College and has been accepted into Nova Southeastern University where he will pursue a degree in Marine Science. Sacred Basin is a 2019 graduate of the Bermuda High School for Girls. She plans to pursue a degree in women's studies at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, Nova Scotia as a precursor to a career in law and politics. And Keziah Bean Faustin, a 2019 graduate of the Barclay Institute. She is, she is of the first, first cohort of graduates to receive a Bermuda Alternative School Diploma. She plans to study a degree in early childhood education at Coventry College in Coventry, England. Mr. Speaker, the recipients of the Minister's Bermuda College Book Award are determined by the Bermuda College, and these decisions are still pending. Mr. Speaker, I'll now share the recipients of the remaining scholarship and awards determined by the Board of Education. The recipients of the 2019 Non-Traditional Student Award are Nolene Fleming. She will pursue a degree in Business Administration at the Mount St. Vincent University through the Bermuda College Partnership Affiliation. Shari Young, she plans to study business administration with a major in accounting at Mount St. Vincent University, also through the Bermuda College Partnership Affiliation. And Scott Burrows, currently a sophomore at Warwick University in the UK, studying marketing and communication. The recipients of the 2019 Teacher Education Scholarships are Grace Craters, a junior student at Temple University in Philadelphia. She is studying science and mathematics. And Kanisha DeShields, a junior student at Georgia Gwinnett College in Lawrenceville, Georgia, specializing in special education. Mr. Speaker, these teacher education scholarships are given to candidates to pursue initial teacher training and, as a condition of their scholarship, will work as teachers in the public school system. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, the ministry awarded a total of 30 further education awards, which are too numerous to name this morning. However, the full list of all scholarship and award recipients will be available later today on the ministry's website at www.moed.bm. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you that it is refreshing, it is encouraging, and it is most gratifying to know that our young Bermudians are bold in their aspirations 
and pursuit of post-secondary studies that will lead to a mix of professional careers. We are extremely proud of all 49 scholarship and award recipients. I will ask my honorable colleagues to join me in congratulating our students and wishing them success as they further their studies. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I thank the chairmen, the chairpersons, and members of the Minister's Scholarship and Awards Committee, the Board of Education Scholarship Committee, as well as the Scholarships and Awards Team of the Ministry of Education Headquarters. It is with passion and dedication that they serve to help ensure our students are positioned for ultimate success. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The next statement is in the name of the Minister of Tourism and Transport, Minister Silva. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the House is aware of this government's unwavering commitment to creating and supporting professional training and development opportunities for Bermudians. The House is also aware of this government's continued efforts to optimize and improve the airport deal to maximize benefits for Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to update members on the recent achievements of Michelle Bean, a Bermudian who unifies and represents both government commitments. Michelle is the Director of Public-Private Partnerships, or P3, Contract Management at the Bermuda Airport Authority. She is responsible for contract oversight of the Airport Redevelopment P3 project and the 33 concession agreement. In her role, she ensures the airport developer and operator's obligations are fulfilled in accordance with the various contracts and regulations. Over a 13-month period, Michelle recently completed the APMP, sorry, APMG P3 certification program and is now a certified public-private partnership professional, or what is known as CP3P. This program is an internationally supported innovation of the Asian Development Bank, American Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank, and the World Bank Group. In Michelle, Bermuda has a qualified, certified professional capable of managing complex infrastructure challenges like those experienced at our airport redevelopment project. Mr. Speaker, recognizing the potential for future P3 agreements on the island and this government's goal of ensuring Bermudians are effectively prepared to lead these future projects, we are excited to celebrate Michelle's recent accomplishment and look forward to more Bermudians receiving this and similar high-value professional certifications. I ask, this honorable, I ask the honorable members of this House to join me in congratulating Michelle for her achievement and hard work and in wishing her future, future success in her role representing and fighting for Bermuda's interest as a member of the Airport Authority team. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister, that the fourth statement is also in your name. Would you like yes. to do that one? Yes, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, I was hoping to have uh, Michelle being here today, but, of course, she's, she's quite busy tied up with some engineering work uh, at the airport and um, couldn't be with us here today. But I'm sure she feels our excitement and spirit, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. My second statement, Mr. Speaker, I rise this morning to report on the launch of Bermuda's newest hotel development. You may recall that my colleague, the Minister of Public Works, announced in March 2018 the conversion of the Grand Atlantic site into a new mid-market boutique hotel to be renamed the Bermudiana Beach Resort Tapestry Collection by Hilton. Mr. Speaker, the condominium hotel development will provide the best value for money and is most closely aligned with this government's goals of increasing tourist accommodations. The partnership between the Bermuda Housing Corporation, resort specialist Robert McLellan of McLellan & Associates, architectural and interior design firm OBMI Bermuda and Bermuda Realty Company Limited involves the conversion of the existing 78 two- and three-bedroom condominiums into a full-service condo hotel with resort, with resort leisure amenities. The property is being redeveloped by a wholly-owned subsidiary of the Bermuda Housing Corporation with expert input from the specialist resort co-developer team who are providing the design, project management, operations, marketing experience, and resources. 
Mr. Speaker, 71 of the condominiums are being refurbished with new kitchens and bathrooms, additional windows, and new floor coverings. The remaining seven condominiums are being converted into a reception area, bar and restaurant, meeting room, commercial kitchen, spa, and operations support areas. Elevators are to be installed in eight of the nine condominium blocks with the construction of two swimming pools and, and the installation of two trams to provide access to the beach below and add stability to the cliff face. The condominiums available to both local and international purchasers, Mr. Speaker, will be marketed as deeded vacation homes on an outright sale basis. They will, however, be restricted to a maximum 90 nights per year occupancy with the balance of the nights available for use as hotel inventory under a mandatory rental program contract which shares income between individual owners and the resort operating company. Almost 50% of the condominiums will be modified to include lock-off ensuite bedrooms and thus increase the number of suites and rooms available for the hotel accommodations to 111. Mr. Speaker, Phase 1, comprising 70 of the 111 keys, will come online in July next year, with the remaining 41 units in 2021. The agreement with Hilton Franchise will provide access to the worldwide marketing and reservation systems. Mr. Speaker, we are confident that the development of this exciting new tourism property in partnership with Hilton Hotels International will greatly enhance our tourism offerings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. There are no reports of committees. Question period. Question period. The first this morning we do have written questions, and the first two questions have been deferred because the minister is off the island on government matters. And so we'll go to the third written question this morning, and that question is in the name of the member from Constituency Town, Member Dunkley. Would you like to put your question and therefore all response from the Minister of Tourism? You can put your questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to colleagues and the listening audience. To the Honorable Minister, would the Honorable Minister please provide this Honorable House with the total budget, including all government and Bermuda Tourism Authority expenses allocated to hosting the Bermuda Championship at the Port Royal Golf Course from 2019 to 2023. The Bermuda Tourism Authority's title sponsorship is $3.2 million annually, as shared by me previously, Sponsorship agreements and their terms between the PGA Tour and sponsors are deemed confidential by the tour for commercial competitive reasons. This is standard across all sports properties. Are you, are you guys uh, thank you, Minister. Would you supplement? Supplementary or new question? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> supplementary. <laughs> it's a written question. Um, supplementary to your written question or you move on to, moving on to your second question, rather? Supplementary, Mr. Okay. Speaker. Do you supplementary to it, yes? Mr. Speaker, thank the Honorable Minister for that question. In regards to that $3.2 million per year over every year, uh, what additional expenses does the Minister believe will have to be added to that on a year-by-year -year basis to make the tournament successful? Minister? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, none will be added to that. The Tourism Authority's commitment is 3.2 annually, as I stated, and that's where it will stand. Thank you, Minister. Okay, next question. Yes, what's your next question? Uh, question number two, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Would the Honorable Minister please provide this Honorable House the details of the total approved budget for preparing the Port Royal Golf Course in Cobblehouse for the Bermudian Championship in 2019, detailing the total budget cost with an itemized list of main expenses? Understood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the itemized list is being finalized now as we speak. I'm sure the Honorable Member with his past experience knows that these things take a little time. Um, as soon as we have those completed, I will gladly bring uh, all the details uh, to this House via ministerial statement. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, the Honorable Minister's commitment to getting back to me, but 
time is running on, um, and I would have thought this would have been taken care of before the contract was actually signed. Supplementary question, yeah, Mr. Speaker, a question. in regards to preparing the golf course for the championship at the end of October, uh, currently what equipment is required and what uh, functions within agronomy are not working at this point in time. Minister, <coughs> excuse me, Minister. Mr. Speaker, as, as I said, what I'll do is I'll give that in a full detailed summary in due course. Okay. Third question? Uh, supplementary. Supplementary, yes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, staying on the theme of uh, Preparing the golf course, how much time does the minister think is required to have the Port Royal golf course in the championship condition that it will ex be expected to be in? Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, as a former president of Mid-Ocean Club, I'm sure the honorable member knows that uh, there is no deadline for this. It's going to be ongoing, and it'll be ongoing for five years, to be frank. Supplementary. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker. Uh, the minister must be aware of the current condition of the golf course, and there's no sand in the traps. Mrs. Can the Honorable Minister please inform this Honorable House when sand will be put in the traps? Minister? Uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, comes under the remit of the Minister of Public Works, and I'm sure that um, in due course he'll find that out too. Yes, third question. Yes, we want third question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Honorable Minister in question number three please provide this Honorable House a name, beneficial owners, and details of the company that will manage the Bermuda Championship in 2019, including how much they will be paid? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the name of the company is the Bruno Event Team, and you can find them on www bruneventteam.com. They are the operator of the event and we will be responsible for operations and fundraising. They are assuming full financial risk for the delivery of the event under a contract with the PGA Tour, not PTA or the Government of Bermuda. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, um, are there any concessions that the Government of Bermuda has given in hosting this tournament? Minister. Uh, not at this time, but I'm, I'm sure that there may be in the future. Okay. Supplementary. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, is it anticipated that there will be required work permits for this tournament, and if so, how many? Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, that, the Honorable Member, again, certainly, as former president of Mid-Ocean Club and the former being organ certainly being uh, heavily involved with the tournaments similar to this being held at Mid-Ocean will know that answer probably better than me, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary? Yes, please. Oh, take your supplementary. Yes, uh, I would just like to ask who will be managing this project locally? Minister. Well, what the Bruno event team will do is work with the management at Port Royal in organizing the event. Supplementary, everyone's good? We're good? Okay. Well, that brings us to <coughs> excuse me. That brings us to a close of the written questions. We'll now move on to the questions from this morning's statements. And the first is for the Minister of Education, from the member from Constituency 19, Member Atherton. Would you like to put your question? I'm um, I'm sorry. It was I'm looking. In the opposition whip, I'm sorry, you had a question for the Minister of Education, I'm sorry. Opposition whip, yeah. Uh, good morning. Um, Minister, I would just like to know uh, whether we are tracking the young, young students that are traveling overseas for studies. 
are we tracking them? So uh, are we keeping count of uh, who's going and where they're going? And, uh, and if we are, then how long have we been doing that? How long have we been tracking? Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I will answer that question in relation to what I actually spoke about, which was scholarships. And yes, we do track the, uh, the students that we do give, give uh, financial assistance to to see how they're doing. And, and part of the tracking is because sometimes the funding that they have been allocated is more than what they need. And if it is so, the balance of those funds are retained and we use that to give to other students who were not successful. So we do track them and we track them through graduation. In fact, we had um, one of our former uh, BGS scholarship recipients speak at the event on Wednesday where we issued the um, scholarships. Thank you, Minister. Supplementary? Uh, in that tracking, so do we know how many of the scholarship holders when, upon graduation are returning to Bermuda? And then what are we doing to assist them in their professional journey um, once they come back? And if they come back, if they don't come back, do we track where they go? Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that information I will have to, um, I'll have to commit to getting back to that member. It, it's not something that was contained in the statement. So I cannot speak to it with any authority at this moment. But we do track our scholarship recipients. Thank you. No further questions? No supplementary? We'll move on to the next statement. And the next statement, uh, questions are for Minister De Silva in reference to your second statement regarding the hotel development at Bermuda Anna Beach. And the first question is from the Deputy Opposition Leader. Honorable Member, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. I just have a couple of questions. First, um, I remember that we did meet in the House some time ago, BHC, uh, um, Minister Birch, about setting up the Holyoke subsidiaries. So for this development, has the company been set up? And if so, what's the name of the company? Minister? Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I'll get that for you. In fact, I'll get it for you before the morning time. Okay, and just supplementary to that question is if I could also have the name of the directors and officers of the company? Sure. I'll, I'll undertake to get that. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary or new question? New question. Right. Um, so will these condos be under the Government's Condominium Act? Because I know that in some instances a developer will set up a development company and then once it's developed then the shares are transferred to the owners under the Government Condominium Act. I don't think that that happens. So how are they going to what, how is the, how's it going to work? Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll include that in the information that I give the honorable member later. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Okay. Supplementary. Any further questions? You. Minister, you have a second member who would like to ask questions. That's the member from Constituent 10. Member Dunkley, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the honorable minister, on the bottom of page 2, in the last paragraph, the Honorable Minister stated the property is being redeveloped by a wholly owned subsidiary of the Bermuda Housing Corporation with the expert input from the Specialist Resort co-developer. Um, to the Honorable Minister, what will be the investment by government and the Bermuda Housing Corporation in this um, planned venture going forward, and what is the investment by McClellan and Associates uh, going forward? Minister. Uh, as it goes forward, I'll give you that information as well. Supplementary, a new question. Um, supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Uh, I would assume, Mr. Speaker, that there is a budget of the amount that uh, is available to be invested by the Bermuda Housing Corporation, so I'd like to know that figure. And what, let me rephrase this question another way, what commitment in dollars has McClellan and Association given to this program? Uh, I, will, I will give that information along with the first lot of information as well. Thank you. Next question. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. On the top of page three, the Honorable Minister said that the remaining seven condos will be converted into reception area, bar, restaurant, meeting room, commercial kitchen, spa, and operation support. Question to the Honorable Minister. Who is responsible for that development and what is the budget for it? Again, specifically, I'll get those to kick with the other two questions as well. Thank you. Any question? 
Yes, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Um, the condominiums, the minister says, will be available to both local and international purchasers. Uh, what is the estimated price of the sale of the condominiums? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I will get those because that's going to be a little bit of a moving target. Um, but I believe they're starting in the lower 400s and up. Um, but again, I will get that to the honorable member. As he knows, we're working with a local uh, real estate firm uh, to do that for us. Thank you. Concludes your questions. Minister, you also have a question from another member, the member from constituency 19, Matheson. Now you can put your question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, through you to the, um, the minister. The, the last sentence in the first paragraph on page three says, elevators are to be installed in eight of the nine condominium blocks with the construction of two swimming pools and the installation of two trams <coughs> to provide access to the beach below and add stability to the cliff face. Could you clarify what is being done to add stability to the cliff face? Minister? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I'll be happy to table um, a little um, uh, brochure, a booklet, uh, for the honorable members of the House to view. Uh, and in that, it very clearly shows what will be done uh, to install these, uh, what they call, sliding stairs. Um, so the honorable member can have a good look and see exactly what we're going to do with that uh, cliff face. The good thing is, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, unlike uh, some reports that were floating around in, in the past, if you go up on site, and I invite all members to do just that, to look at our newest uh, tourism product, uh, they will see that the cliff is not falling in. And that, uh, in fact, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Hilton Hotels for the confidence they have in Bermuda to invest in a tourism product. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Minister. Any further questions? Just for clarification, because I'm sure I heard it correctly, but for those listeners out there, you're saying that by putting in these elevators, that that effectively adds the stability to the cliff, and you're going to table some sort of brochure, et cetera, so that I and other people can see it. Uh, no, the elevators are, elevators are in the building condos themselves. <laughs> so the honorable member got a little confused. What I did table, what I did table was the uh, mechanical stairs that they can use to get down to the beach, and that is, that I have tabled it. It's sitting on the table, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No more questions? That brings us to a close of the question period this morning. Uh, Mr. Speaker, just, just one question. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, in, in relation to last week's question and Rule 17.9.7, I just would like to request for the Honorable Minister of Finance to give a reply to the deferred questions for last week. I, I, I have these questions. I have the responses. Yeah. I just received them. They're sent, they've been sent to your parliament. Okay, thank you. I'll take a look at them and let yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. they, have been for, they have been forwarded to you. Yes. Okay. Congratulatory and obituary speeches. <coughs> Would, any, <coughs> Would any member wish to speak? We recognize the deputy speaker. Deputy, I'm Deputy Premier, rather. Deputy Premier, you have the floor. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I don't know if this was already done in a previous sitting, but I'd like to uh, offer a condolence message to the family of Ms. Ina Wilkinson, who passed away um, some weeks ago. But her family this month, last week, had she was interred, I believe, at Trinity Church in Hamilton Parish, and her family had a um, going away ceremony in her honor, bringing together family and friends of her and her family. She was the wife of the former speaker, Mr. David Wilkinson, and also a longstanding member of this house. Uh, Ms. Wilkinson was a wonderful, beautiful person. She originated in Norway, um, came to Bermuda in the 1950s and met her um, husband and has a daughter, Linda, and a number of uh, children and grandchildren. But uh, she, well, like Bermuda was her home all that time, and my meeting with her, uh, my occasion to meet with her and become um, a uh, friend of hers was not by chance, but 
Um, she was someone who certainly understood the responsibilities of public service and was always very encouraging to me whenever we had the chance to meet. Clearly, uh, uh, being associated with a family that had a long history of public service, she understood what that meant, irrespective of what side of the house that you sat. And so I wish to ensure that, the, that there is a condolence message in the record to her as a her and her family, Linda, her daughter, Linda's children and grandchildren, all of which I know miss her dearly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Deputy. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize the Premier. Premier, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, I would like to, um, at this point in time, ask this Honorable House uh, to please send a letter of condolence uh, to the family of uh, the late Ms. V. Jeanette Cannonier OBE. And of course, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to associate all members of this mm -hmm. Honorable House. Yes, yes. Ms. Cannonier served as chairman of the Public Service Committee for 14 years and retired in 1997 after a total of 20 years of service. She answered the call to public service as an independent senator in the other place and was instrumental in the call for mandatory seatbelts in Bermuda. Mrs. Cadnier understood the importance of caring for our seniors and fought for better care for them. We send our thoughts and prayers to our family and friends during their time of mourning. And as you would note, Mr. Speaker, the government did release an official statement um, on her passing. Mr. Speaker, moving to congratulations um, and, of course, associating all members of this Honorable House uh, rather presumptuously, would like to um, ask that congratulations be said to Bermuda's women, women's national football team, the under-20 national football team, for their performance in the CONCACAF Women's Championship. They did manage a win against Suriname, and they have certainly, sorry, Okay. And they are certainly um, making sure that they are continuing the legacy of which has been set by those ones who were in the under-15s or under-16s uh, last year in their performance. Also, I'd like to send a big congratulations uh, to uh, Bermuda's representatives of the NatWest Island Games that completed in athletics, swimming, bowling, squash, volleyball, badminton, and Gibraltar. Uh, they brought home a number of medals. The Minister for Labor, Community Affairs, and Sports did receive them when they came back, and I just wanted to make sure that their achievements was recognized. Mr. Speaker, I would also like to associate myself with the congratulations, and certainly the government, and all members of the House with the congratulations which you gave at the beginning of this morning's session for Hallie Tiart and Crusader Smith for their outstanding performance at the debating, uh, the youth parliament debate in Trinidad and Tobago. However, Mr. Speaker, we have another group of debaters who may be visiting the House Assembly this morning, and I want to express congratulations to the two debate teams that competed in the Heart of Europe tournament in the Czech Republic and the, the independent Bermuda team and the dynamic debaters. Team independent shone brightly as they took second place to South Korea, with Haley O'Donnell winning award for best overall speaker of the tournament. This, Mr. Speaker, certainly was a job well done, and I look forward to hopefully hearing them take their place in this House Assembly at some point in time in the future to add to our debates. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Premier. Anyone else wish to recognize the Honorable Member from Constituency Number 2? Honorable Member Swan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to be associated with the condolences being offered to the late Jeanette Cannoneer. I did not know my cousin had passed away. Um, we come from that long line of Andersons that came out of Cell Cattle and her through the ushers. And I served with her in the other place for many, many, many years, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. And I will remember that one time when, in the early days, when, when a vote came down on the Motor Car Amendment Act, and sometimes the language gets a little confused, and someone was intending to go left and ended up going right. But that notwithstanding, Ms. Kenner could be counted on to speak her mind. And she gave great service in the banking industry as well as being a member of the Public Service Commission for many, many years. And so, Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to be associated as one who uh, knew her and her family on a little bit per more personal level, 
extend my condolences as well. Any other members to speak? I recognize the Honorable Member Simons from Constituency A. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Member, you have the floor. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to associate myself with the comments made in regards to Senator Jeanette Cannonier. Uh, we call it past in the banking um, community as well as in the legislature. She was committed to um, public service, and she was passionate. She was a clear speaker and a concise speaker, and she did not mince her words. I remember quite clearly she and the late Nelson Baskin, myself, were at a um, CPA conference in Namibia years ago. And we went to this game reserve and had exotic meal. There was crocodiles and snakes on the menu, and we were sitting around Jamar deciding who was going to eat what, and, and everyone had to choose one of them. Well, it was the funniest thing you could imagine. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to also associate myself with the comments made in regards to Anya Wilkinson. I know her well. Um, her daughter and I share a um, arts foundation together, so I was at her house many times, and she always had something to say. And she also was interested in what was going on in Bermuda, and she was quite liberal in her thoughts. So I commend her, and I, you know, convey my condolences to her family. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to also send congratulatory remarks to Ms. Myrtle Ednes. She went 105 on the 17th of July. Mm -hmm. This lady is like... Yes, I'd like to associate the Honorable Member Scott and Ms. Jean Atherton. Uh, Ms. Ednes was my neighbor. She knew me before I knew myself. Um, she used to take me to church, Christ Church of Warwick, when I was a youngster. And she took me swimming. So I called off on her birthday. I said, Ms. Ednes, it's cool. She says, I know, I know. I said, you have a good day? She says, I'm trying, I'm trying. I said, you've been swimming yet? She says, no. I said, well, come down my house. Tell Marine, bring you to my house and come for a swim. So I saw Marine in town yesterday. She says, cool. Myrtle has been asking me every day, when am I going swimming? When am I going swimming? This woman is so agile. She's as agile as a 60-year-old. And she gets up every Sunday and, and goes to church and walks up, and, and she can hold her own. That's the social ear. It's the social ear. I took my grandson off to see her one day, and I was, like, reluctant to give it to this 104-year-old um, lady. And she took him and he's not a small child, and held him and walked up and down. I said, Ms. Edna, sit down. She said, what for? What for? And this is what the energy that we're talking about. She, I mean, she has memory left at times. And I said to her once, I said, you know who you're talking to? She said, yes, you. I said, <laughs> I said well, who's you? Simon. Simon. <laughs> anyway, I thank you, Amber. And wish her many more years. Mr. Thank you. Thank you. We now recognize the honorable member, the um, government whip, the other member. Thank you, Mr. Board. Speaker. I'd just like to pick up where uh, that honorable mess left off, and I'll be associated with his um, congratulations to Ms. Flora Ednis. Um, yes. Uh, he, he, he's, he's more familiar with her than I am. Um, I, that, <laughs> sorry, Mar I'm sorry, Myrtle Ednis. Um, for me, I... When I was growing up, I knew her to have the to be the to be the head of uh, to have the candy shop down at, on South Shore, um, and and that so she was a superhero to me. You got all um, your sweets. <laughs> but but she but Mr. Speaker, you'll be glad to know that she does hail, originally hail from Somerset, and then she then re, then she then she moved to reside on Billy Goat Hill, and um, and the one thing that we do have in common is that. Her granddaughter and I were in the same uh, class, uh, Melanie, her granddaughter Melanie and I were in the same class at Gilbert. And um, even up to her 90s, she was walking up and down the 101 steps back there to go for a swim. And as the member said that, um, and I, don't, I can't even make it up and down the 101 steps now, but I just want to uh, once again wish her a happy 105th birthday. Now, I would just like to also have a lot of congratulations sent to Team Involved for the Bermuda Futsal Association. They actually took the uh, Bermuda Futsal Association title and they narrowly beat out um, Athletico CP. Uh, I have to declare my interest. I was a goalkeeper for Athletico CP. 
Um, and no, I, no, we drew. We they had not. They no one all. And um, the with a team involved, they had twenty four. They ended up with a tw twenty four points. Atletico CP had twenty two. If we had won that game, we would have taken the title. But we drew with them, um, and that was the only draw for the season. They had eight wins, no draws until they played us, and one loss. Atletico CP had seven wins one draw, and one loss. So, um, you know, I, I feel as though... Uh, but one thing is, is that I would like to just recognize the Bermuda Football Association. This is their fourth... This is their fifth year in, in existence, and it's a very good program. I encourage members to, um, to go out and look at it and join if they can. Um, but once again, congratulations to Team Involved for taking the um, championship title uh, for the Bermuda Football Association. Thank you, member. Now I recognize the Honorable Member from Constituency 19. Honorable Member? Mr. Speaker, I'd like, to, I'd like to have um, condolences sent to the family of the late Norma Christensen. I remember Norma as someone that I met many, many years ago when I was treasurer of the Art Society. As I said to someone, I can't draw a lick. But I, I was embraced by the members of the society because I decided that I would become their treasurer to help them get organized. And Norma was always there as someone who did lots of things and was very encouraging. She was a member of Mid-Ocean as well, and she will be missed by all of those who came in contact with her. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Thank you Member. Does any other member wish to speak? Do you recognize Honorable Member from Constituency 11, Honorable Member Famous? Good morning, Mr. Speaker and colleagues, and good morning, Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to give condolences to the family of Ms. Mary Defunts of Devonshire. She was born and raised on a farm on Roberts Avenue, and then she moved to Middle Road in Devonshire. So for 101 years of her life, she's been a strong Devonshire woman. So I'd like to give condolences to her family. I would like to also congratulate MP, sorry, Deputy Speaker Burgess, MP Leah Scott, MP Scott Simmons for representing Bermuda at the CPA conference in Trinidad. Uh, I've got constant WhatsApps from other colleagues down there saying how well they represented our island and this honorable house. And I'd like to give congratulations to my aunt, Ms. Helene Mateen, some may know as Helene Bartley and Ms. Valerie Deal for the second annual Seniors Cup Match event held at Dr. Cairns' residence for seniors in, not Somerset, but somewhere up there, Southampton, that's her. Rockaway, that's it. So, Mr. Speaker, 60 or over 60 seniors came out dressed in their colors, blue and blue or their other colors, and they had fun, they had food, they had dessert, they had a lot of rivalry. And they just wanted to express to all members of the house that they tune in every Friday faithfully, so they'll be listening today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other Honorable Member wish to speak? No other Honorable Member? Before we move on, though, I believe the Young persons who are being escorted into the gallery right now with Mr. Millett are the uh, debate team that we acknowledged a few moments ago for their accomplishments. Am I correct, Mr. Millett? And so we'd just like to take this, and Mr. Thompson, I didn't notice you until you came in at the back, Mr. Thompson. But we'd just like this moment to um, acknowledge your accomplishments and say welcome to the gallery this morning. And the House gave congratulations to you just a few moments ago with members recognizing your accomplishments. Again, congratulations. And I see a big piece of silverware. I, uh, I, I see a big piece. I said silverware, but it actually looks like a very large girl cop. So you, you, you can stand there so we can see the girl cop, if you don't mind. Oh. Members, hold it up. There you go. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good. Congratulations. We will now move on to the next item. Matters of privilege. There are none. Personal explanation. There are none. Notice of motion for the adjournment of the household matters of urgent public importance. There are none. Introduction of bills. There is a bill 
to be going on this morning in the name of the Minister of Health. Um, would I, would you, would Minister of Finance, will you assist? Yes, Mr. Speaker. I'm introducing the following bill for its first reading so that it may be placed on the order paper for the next day of meeting. The Child Safeguarding Miscellaneous Amendments Act of 2019. Thank you. Orders of the day. Orders of the day. We now move on to the orders of the day, and we believe the first item to be addressed this morning is actually in your name, Minister of Finance. It's order number two, the Public Service Superannuation Amendment Act 2019. Are you ready to proceed with that? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I move that the bill entitled the Public Service Superannuation Amendment Act 2019 be now read the second time. Any objections? No objections. Continue on. Mr. Speaker, government wishes this Honorable House now to give consideration to the bill entitled the Public Service Superannuation Amendment Act 2019. The bill seeks to increase the age of compulsory retirement on a voluntary basis from 65 to 68 years for certain public officers, not including police officers, fire officers, prison officers, members of the Royal Bermuda Regiment, and teachers, and to make related amendments. Mr. Speaker, Honorable members are aware that Bermuda, like most of the, the developed world, is faced with the challenges, challenges associated with the growth of an aging population. The result of the projected population for the period 2017 to 2067 illustrates the number of working age persons, persons between the age of 20 and 64, are expected to decline from 40,099 to 25,296. A decrease of 14,800, or 37 percent. This fall in the number of working age is due to the lower birth rate experienced in recent years and the projected continuation of a low birth rate. The number of persons over the current pension age, 65, are expected to increase from 11,080 to 16,168, an increase of 5,106, or 46 percent. The projected ratio of the number of working age to the number of over pension age, the pension, the pensioner support ratio, is projected to fall to 3.6 from 3.6 to 1.6. This phenomenon is not too dissimilar with what is being experienced in other parts of the developed world. To address what is clearly one of the most important demographic issues of the 21st century, it is important that governments prepare early. To this end, honorable members will recall that in the 2018 speech from the throne, the government undertook that, and I, and I quote, the legislature will be invited to discuss options for such revisions to the age of mandatory retirement in the public service, which will, which will preserve the right to retire at 65, but permit a, per, a post holder to work beyond that age without the requirement for, for permission to do so, end quote. Mr. Speaker, this was a promise made in the speech from the throne and is a promise that has been kept. Honorable members will recall that in the lead up to tabling this legislation, the Premier, the Honorable David E. Burt, JPNP, in keeping with the promise to invite the legislature to discuss options for such revisions to the age of mandatory retirement from the public service, tabled a motion on the 10th of May inviting this Honorable House to agree the recommendations of the report of the Labor Advisory Subcommittee entitled Reviewing the Retirement Age, which was also tabled on the 10th of May. Mr. Speaker, as was observed in the, in the November's speech from the throne, in many cases, the designation senior citizen does not describe our energetic men and women aged 65 and older. In most countries, retirement is coming to be re reviewed as a time of personal reinvention and new opportunities, rather than withdrawal and winding down. In addition, there is also a global consensus that old age is no longer determined by traditional markers imposed by society, such as how many birthdays a person has had, or whether a person has retired or has, re or has received a pension check. Instead, personal ability is considered to be the key determinant of age. The above-mentioned report 
that was tabled for the consideration of honorable members provided useful facts and the recommendations from this report were as follows. One, create a single piece of legislation that sets a retirement age, a pensionable age, and allows for reemployment provisions. The aims of the legislation will gradually increase the retirement and pensionable age simultaneously from 65 to 70 years over a 10-year period, with the retirement age moving to 68 within a five-year period. It would allow for annual reemployment contracts to be utilized for five years after the prescribed retirement age. It would ensure early retirement provisions are in place for workplace pensions and CPF payments, and it would ensure employers are not prevented from retaining older employees for as long as it is desired by the employer after the retirement and reemployment periods. Two, it creates new legislation or utilizes existing legislation to prohibit age discrimination in the world of work pertaining to older workers, ensuring quality in recruitment, hiring, compensation, benefits, training, working conditions, and career development. And three, it creates a financial and retirement planning toolkit which can be utilized by employers, workers, and community stakeholders to increase financial levels of the workforce. Mr. Speaker, as previously advised in the first instance, the policy and strategy section within the Cabinet Office will work with the committee, unions, churches, sports clubs, and other key constituencies to implement the financial and retirement planning toolkit recommended by the report. The report provided useful facts and figures, and the key policy objectives of the recommendations were as follows. To stabilize pension funds, to allow working men and women the benefit of greater capacity to earn and therefore better prepare for their eventual retirement, and to use the longer lifespan in the modern era to the benefit of the society and the people of Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, honorable members will recall the comprehensive and thoughtful debate in, in this honorable house on the 31st of May in relation to this matter, and it is not only my intention to reiterate and it is not my intention to reiterate what was expressed during that debate. However, at this time, I am pleased to bring forward this legislation to acknowledge the general support of this Honorable House on this matter portrayed during the 31st of May debate. The purpose of this amendment is to provide for the following. One, it requires contributors, as defined under the Act, say for police officers, fire officers, pen, prison officers, and teachers, to compulsorily retire at 68 years of age. Two, it permits contributors, as set out in one, in one above, to voluntarily retire at 65 years of age, retaining also the ability of contributors, as set out in one above, to retire at 60 years of age. Three, it removes the discretion of the head of the public service in permitting a contributor who has reached the age of compulsory retirement to continue in the public service until the latter age, not excluding, not exceeding, I'm sorry, the age of 70 years. Four, permits contributors as set out in one above to continue in the public service until a later age, not exceeding the age of 70 years, subject to an annual certification of medical fitness and the confirmation of their head of department to the permanent secretary of the relevant ministry that the contributor is competent to fully discharge the duties of the post. And five, confirm that a contributor has reached the age of compulsory retirement and continues in the public service having not retired, he or she shall A, continue to contribute to the fund, B, shall not receive their pension until such time as they have retired from the public service, and C, shall continue to accrue any benefit to which they are entitled on continuing to, the, to contribute to the fund after reaching the age of compulsory retirement. Honorable members should note the proposed amendments meet the policy objectives contained in the 2018 speech from the throne, which were to, and I quote, to revise the mandatory retirement age to take account of a longer lifespan, the necessity to add additional stability to pension funds, and to promote a greater choice among the working population about when one retires from full-time employment, close quotes. Also, it is important to note that consistent with Section 91 of the Bermuda Constitution Order 1968, 
These amendments do not create any pension terms less favorable to officers in the public service than the laws enforced at the time when they were engaged as public officers. Mr. Speaker, I can also advise honorable members that an actuarial review of the public service superannuation fund determined, and I quote, as instructed, we also consider the impact of allowing members to retire on a voluntary basis up to age 67. We found that such a change would not have a material impact on long-term sustainability. What could generate a material change, however, would be a change to the normal retirement age from 65 to 67 with actuarial reductions or early retirement prior to age 67, end quote. Further support for these proposals is provided in the 2018 report of the, of the Fiscal Responsibility Panel, which noted under section entitled Tackling Unfunded Pension Liabilities, and I quote, currently the territory's public sector pension fund schemes for its employees have an unfunded liability of around a billion dollars. Unless tackled, this will be a burden on future budgets. In addition, the Contributory Pension Fund also has a large unfunded liabilities, and it is inconceivable that the government would allow it to fail. So debt reduction needs to be contemplated by actions to address these deficits. Actions that reduce the need for sharply increased contribution rates include raising the retirement age, which would also mitigate the expected decline in the workforce, and for public sector employees, basing pension on the average of salaries over a five-year period and actuarial pensions reductions for early re reductions for early retirees. Mr. Speaker, the proposals contained in this legislation are reflective of the changing demographics of the Bermuda's population, which must be mitigated by the ability of people to work for longer and contribute to a fund that supports public officers in retirement. Honorable members are advised that an increase in the age of retirement for uniformed service personnel and teachers will be the subject of a fulsome consultative effort with the, with the service chiefs and their representative unions. In closing, it is important to note that in order to solve the aging population dilemma in a holistic manner, we must first and foremost recognize that this is more than an issue of Social Security and pension plan benefits and taxes. Fundamentally, it is a question of finding ways to improve economic growth and integration. With those introductory remarks, Mr. Speaker, I now read for the second time the bill entitled the Public Service Superannuation Amendment Act 2019 and welcome other members' contributions to this debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Does any other member wish to speak to this? We recognize the Honorable Member from Constituency 22. Honorable Member Pearman, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Honorable Minister notes, this uh, piece of legislation flows from the report of the Labor Advisory Subcommittee, and we had an extensive debate in this House. Uh, I believe it was on the 31st of May. I may have my date wrong, um, but I believe it was on the 31st of May to discuss this proposal. And it was uh, quite a, a long debate, but it was also refreshingly, Mr. Speaker, quite a bipartisan one. And um, what this is doing, and, and just for the benefit of those listening to the public, because sometimes we can get caught up in the, the words of legislation and it gets uh, complex and confusing, but the retirement age is, is, is remaining where it is uh, at 65 with permission to, to stay until 68. And there was a discussion during the previous debate as to whether or not it should be 67. And indeed, the Honorable Member Derek Burgess during the debate um, suggested, and I agreed with him, uh, that maybe we should even consider going to 70. Um, nonetheless, this is where the government has decided to go, the age of 68. Uh, and we've heard explanations from the Honorable Minister as to why 68 was chosen instead of 67, which was the provisional uh, date. Um, turning to the points made by the Honorable Minister, Mr. Speaker, um, it is right that society and our expectations and understandings of what people can do based upon their age, has fundamentally changed. And not only has it fundamentally changed at the high end, but it also has an impact at the low end of the age scale. Um, we said previously, or I said previously in, in the last debate, that 60 is the new 40, and indeed 70 is the new 50. And I see some honorable members across the aisle nodding their head. Um, 
and, and it is true. And, and the said the idea, um, the idea that certain people in the workforce must have a forcible departure because of the year in which they were born is, is simply nonsensical. It was probably nonsensical back then, but it's certainly nonsensical in this day and age. Um, and I won't repeat what I said in the previous debate, but just touch quickly on it, Mr. Speaker. You know, we do see companies that recognize that actually people around 70 may well be far better at, at being employees and dealing with the public and the customers, given the wisdom of life experience that they carry with them. And that is correct. Um, we also touched in the debate, and I don't know which to repeat too much because we, we, we covered it, but, but we also touched on the concept of age discrimination and the public call uh, by Ms. Claudette Fleming on behalf of her charity or the charity which she represents, uh, Age Concern. Uh, and, and we touched on, on the fact that, that age discrimination takes many shapes and forms, and, and we reminded ourselves that you can actually have age discrimination against the young as well. And it is notable that one of the uh, consequences of, of, of this move, intended or otherwise, is that those who are more youthful and coming into the public sector at the younger end of the age scale uh, may uh, feel that this will prevent their acceleration through uh, the public sector by reason of people at the higher end of the age scale remaining. And, and I think that's a legitimate criticism and it's a criticism that we've, we've seen, but, but I don't think it is a criticism that outweighs the importance of recognizing the contributions that those at the older end of the age scale give to our community. Uh, as I say, um, 60 is the new 40 and 70 is the new 50. Um, with that, Mr. Speaker, um, I shall take my seat. I don't know if others on this side wish to comment, but we are supportive of this bill. Uh, we, it's, it's refreshing to see uh, a bipartisan effort in this House. It's always nice when we can do that. I know we don't agree about everything, but it's nice to see something when we do. Um, I, I know that there are some out in the public who have expressed concern and feel that this means they will be working forever. Uh, but let's just emphasize that what this legislation does is impose a voluntary position. It allows people in the public sector to remain to 68 should they choose to do so. And I think that those who have uh, criticized this piece of legislation as making people work until the day they die respectfully haven't understood the nuance. The nuance is that you may work to 65, and then if you wish, you may stay on to 68. And that's a very important point, I think, for the public to grab. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's all I have to say. There may be others on this side who wish to speak to this legislation, but we, the opposition, will support it in a bipartisan way. Thank, thank you, Honorable Member. I recognize the Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, would you like to add a contribution? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Continue on. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm so happy that this bill has finally come to Parliament because I think that we have been treating our folks particularly those that were on 65, unfairly uh, operating on the age discrimination in Bermuda. Um, that needs to be addressed, hopefully, by the human rights. They'll have a bill here because there's nowhere in this world we should have age discrimination. They don't have it in the UK. They don't have it in America and most parts of, the, of, of Europe. They don't have that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me say that um, before people get it confused. Um, this bill will take the retirement age to 65, and as uh, the Honorable Member Impairment says, you don't, you could, if you want to retire at 65, you can, but you can go to 68. But let me say that. This does not affect the social insurance check. Even though you decide to go to 68, that social insurance check that you get at 65 will continue. Um, so the only check you will not get is your superannuation check. You'll only get that when you retire. So let me, uh, I think it's worth repeating. If you retire at 65, you will still be eligible and get your social insurance check at 65, um, provided that you put the necessary forms in, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, sending people home, it's, it's, I'm going to repeat some things I've said before. I think it's, we need to do that. Sending people home at 65 has caused great hardship to our folks, Mr. Speaker. And under the present system, 
it's unfair in my opinion because there's only one person that makes that decision. And that to me is not democratic. And so with this here, that would eradicate that there, Mr. Speaker, because as we all know, when you send these folks home at 65, they're faced with um, health insurance adjustments as far as costs and, and, and medicine, Mr. Speaker. Health insurance and medicine are costing most people more than groceries. That should never be, Mr. Speaker. Um, so, and in fact, I was speaking to a friend yesterday, last night, and because this fellow has gone 55, that's one of the criteria the insurance company mm -hmm. use as a reason to increase their insurance premiums. Its premiums went from about $820 a month up to 1200 and some, over $300 increase. And using the age of 55 plus as one of the reasons, to me that's, 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 um, that, that, that's, uh, that's, that's wrong <laughs> and it needs to be corrected. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, I, I, I would, I, I won't name the insurance company because I think they're all doing it, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, this will certainly help all the workers, and particularly black workers, because as we know, pensions came late for the majority of the workers in Bermuda. It started very late, so they weren't, they're not worth that much. Particularly when you take, for example, uh, I think I mentioned the other day, Mr. Speaker, food, the increase in food. I know I was getting, I get oats, and they were costing just under nine dollars. They're going to over to, over eleven dollars uh, um, for a bag, Mr. Speaker. That's almost what 20, 24 percent increase. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and other things go up like that, Mr. Speaker. So, our seniors, those that are sixty-five or approaching sixty-five, I know they can breathe a sense of relief that they can go to sixty-eight. And it, to me, it should go right to seventy. But anyhow, sixty-eight is better than sixty-five, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, because when, when we look at, I never forget, Mr. Speaker, when I went to the Privy Council in the early 2000s, I think it was 2002, uh, we had about five uh, law judges there in the Privy Council, and they were sharp. They, I mean, they were brilliant. Mm -hmm. And every last one of them, I'm sure, was going 75. But they knew the stuff, they were brilliant. And obviously, they made the right decision in the judgment, Mr. Speaker. So, and we have in Bermuda, our appeals judges are going 70 plus. And this is where the discrimination comes in because we're telling people, because you're 65, you've got to go home, but others can stay until forever, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. You know, in the United States, when they, when they uh, um, appoint the judges to the Supreme Court, the the highest court in, in, in America, they're there for life. 80, 90 years old. They go to life. So, Mr. Speaker, and we're down here doing something different. So this bill is, is, is certainly uh, a, a win for those folks, particularly those that have it difficult, that they're still paying rent or still paying a mortgage and, and, and the, other, the other expenses they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, Mr. Speaker. And then the availability of workers, Mr. Speaker, um, has been pointed out already. Uh, in, in by the year 2030, mm -hmm. um, people going 65 would be a very large portion of the population of Bermuda. I think over 30 percent. And you know, one day they'll come together at 30 percent and say, "Okay, you think you can treat us like this? We've got all this power and a vote, and you can think you can just go in Parliament." and make laws, they're going to come together and let you know you're not going to treat us like that, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, with that, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank, thank them, thank them, uh, the, uh, one of the things, Mr. Speaker, Go ahead. Um, mm -hmm. as the minister has alluded to and stated that certain positions we know will retire earlier because of the physical requirements of the job. Uh, you don't expect the fireman to be climbed ladder at 68 or 65. And that's why, under the legislation, they retire earlier, but it's brought up in proportion to this 68, Mr. Speaker. Because, um, as the Honorable Member Perriman says, yes, 40 is the new 70. 
you know, um, some of my folks were 60, I should say. They, no, no, no. Um, for, 40 is the new 60. <laughs> yes. 60 is the new 40. 60 is the new 40. Oh, 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 70 is the new 50. Person, whatever. I think you know what I'm talking about. All those listeners will know that um, 60 is the new... <laughs> 60 is new 40. And but speaking, we heard people on, the, on this house, particularly from the other side, say that they, they think you should retire to the speaker. Uh, uh, no, they weren't told to the speaker. I'm, I'm, sure, the speaker. I'm <laughs> sure they weren't told to the speaker now. <laughs> well, I thought they were told to you, Mr. Speaker. No, no. I, I, I knew they were referring to me. I, they? I'm sure they like their seat. They don't want to lose their seat today. They don't want to be put out. Uh, uh, but, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, timely, a bit late, but it's it's here and we were thankful for this here and on behalf of all those workers out there that are 64 65 i want to say thank you to this government and thank you for this house because there seems to be support from both sides so again thank you thank you thank you thank you mr deputy i now recognize the deputy opposition leader i'm a member you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not going to be long. I would like to just echo the sentiments of my colleagues on both sides of the house. And I actually have taken my mother's position as I don't know how old I am and I don't see what difference it makes. So I probably won't be able to retire because nobody will be able to figure out what my retirement age is. <laughs> I support this legislation um, for multiple reasons. Um, it will allow people to continue to contribute into their pension fund. Um, and it allows seniors or, and you know, they automatically assume that at the age of 55 you're a senior because I do have an age concern card. I declare my interest at 55. And be quiet. Um, being a senior does not necessarily mean that you are then um, incapable or unable of making decisions, of being able to work, of being able to function. And in fact, people who are allowed to continue working keep their brains going. They keep their, it extends their life. It does all kinds of things to contribute to their lively life production and also society. And I think to um, my cousin's point across the aisle, where we have lawyers and doctors and judges, the older you get, the more knowledge you seem to have amassed. Well, why doesn't that same principle apply to people who are not in those sort of professional, and I say that in quotes, fields. You know, the knowledge that you gain, no matter what area you are in, is valuable. And I think that allowing people to stay on beyond the time that they're um, required to retire is, is allowing for a transition. So you've got people that can come in, you can start training. You don't have a brain drain when people are, are leaving the environment. So I certainly do support it. And I look for, oh, I just had one question, and maybe it will probably be better... Um, better suited in committee, but just on um, from 65 to 68, but then there's a proviso that says that they can go up to 70, but you've got to meet certain conditions. So it's not a hard and fast stop at 68. Um, and as I said, that may be better answered in committee, but that was the only other question that I had to raise. So thank, the go thank you to the government for bringing this legislation as um, it is timely, and I think that a lot of people, once they understand what the legislation will do, will be satisfied with it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Now I recognize the Honorable Member, Ms. Ferbert from Constituency 4. Honorable Member, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to everyone in the listening audience. Um, I, I particularly want to speak to this um, bill. I am definitely in support of it. I'm working with um, a senior population. A lot of times, even uh, notice younger people uh, refusing to believe that they're going to get older <laughs> one day. And this will affect, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, this legislation, Mr. Speaker, will affect every single one of us in this room. It will affect every single one of us. And what I particularly appreciate about um, government bills or is that when the public service or government makes a decision or takes a lead on something, then usually you have more acceptance in the private domain and, and we get more uh, following uh, when government takes the lead in making a decision um, such as one like this. This has been a concern to many of my constituents, Mr. Speaker, in regards to you know their worry about having to retire at the age of 65 when they still have bills. Someone mentioned they still have mortgages, they still have 
um, things to pay. And even when we talk about uh, grandchildren or gr gran grandparents still having to raise their grandchildren. And so this will all still factor in, um, you know, our children are having to go overseas to complete studies, grandparents filling in the gaps. Uh, that way they still need access to, to funds and, and to money. Um, I was in church the other day and a gentleman was given a testimony because he was about to retire. His, his um, job had recently told him that he had to finish up uh, very soon. And he was, you know, given a testimony. He was praying about this because he did not want to have to retire because he just was not finished with, with work or wanting to work. And so luckily they, they kept him on. And so I'm very thankful and, um, and hopeful for this legislation that it will change the minds of people and how they actually think of uh, people uh, at the age of 65. Because the idea of people retiring at 65 there is some. There was a thought out there that people, yeah, you're old, and people waste away, and that is not not the truth. I know personally what happens to the body biologically as we age. There are some things that do happen to the body. However, if you keep the body active both uh, mentally and physically, then you reap the benefits um, of that. You know, we get up every day. There's purpose. There's motivation. There's movement. And what happens to your body when there is uh, movement, um, it's just an overall benefit. It's an overall benefit. And so we, we don't want our seniors to be inactive. Um, we want uh, people to be, <laughs> we want them to be aging healthy and, and having purpose to go to an occupation every day will help to, help to maintain that. There's, I just also wanted to share that. <clears throat> There are also benefits, um, I think a uh, fellow, fellow uh, colleague Pyramid mentioned in regards to the concern of um, not have younger persons not having access to the workplace. But there are actually benefits to having a multi-generational uh, workforce. And, you know, the, the, only, the key thing is, is that they have to be willing to work together. Sometimes when you go into the workplace, the, the mature uh, employee is not sharing with the younger employee. There's not that mentorship sort of relationship because they feel as though the younger person is going to come and take their job. But we want, we want people in our workplace to be the very best that they can be. And so we should be learning from, from uh, the more mature senior employee as well as the more mature senior employee learning from the younger employee. And so that is definitely a benefit um, that we can look forward to. Also, there are also benefits to hiring a more mature employee, and those include um, usually mature employees are less stressed out because they know, you know, they know the job pretty well. Um, they're passionate employees, and passionate employees do not have an expiration date. They set good examples. They tend to be more punctual and have very strong work ethics, and who doesn't want that in their place of employment? There's better work for knowledge transfer. Uh, it also promotes uh, staff retention and it creates a workplace of uh, diversity and inclusion. So with all of that said, Mr. Speaker, I definitely support this bill. I'm looking forward to it myself as I age and uh, very thankful that we made a very, um, a very strong commitment to to our uh, aging population. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Now I recognize the Honorable Member from constituency number eight, Honorable Member Simons. You have the floor. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'll be very, very brief. Um, a, a number of things have been said that um, I'm sure these uh, parliamentarians were looking over my shoulder at my notes, so they've cut me short, Mr. Speaker. They, they want to let you know, even though they're in New York, they still got good eyesight. They will see your notes. Believe me, Mr. Speaker. Right. Mr. Speaker, I, like a number of my colleagues, fall into this category. We are seniors, proud to be seniors. Can give you all a run for your money, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am an example of a senior who is working in the private sector. And Mr. Speaker, it does wonders for the organization that I work for. And it does wonders for me. Mr. Speaker, it's not the time, it's the quality. 
It's the quality, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I as was said earlier, encouraging our seniors to stay on beyond 65 years old is good for them from a health perspective, as was said by my previous speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a number of doctors I've spoken with have indicated to me it's important for seniors to keep their brains active and stimulated and motivated. It's important for them to get physical exercise. And Mr. Speaker, by them working, they have to get up, leave their home, go to Hamilton, go to St. George's, walk around, deal with the business, Mr. Speaker. And by them being working and active, it helps them physically. And it just, it's just healthier for them, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, my cousin, the Honorable Derek Burgess, raised the issue of insurance. Mr. Speaker, you will find that many seniors have consultancy jobs with a number of local businesses, international businesses, and even some of our local businesses. But the challenges that they have is that their insurance, health insurance, is not being covered, Mr. Speaker. So the question becomes, what will be the next step to provide health insurance to these people beyond the age of 65? Mr. Speaker, the, the um, knock-on effect, Mr. Speaker, if we're saying that people may work until they're 68, if I leave and find a new opportunity at 67 years old and go to a, one of my ideal jobs and I change companies, will I be able to join that company at 67 and have insurance? And I probably would not have that benefit. So I'm suggesting that we look at our health insurance in these uh, companies and have them do a review of their employee benefits plans. The other issue, Mr. Speaker, again, that was issued. As long as you are working, you will not enjoy the benefits, the retirement benefits of your superannuation. Mr. Speaker, a constituent came to me and said, Mr. Simons, I've been working all my life. I went 65 years old and I have this very large pension nest egg at one of our local insurance companies. I called them up, and I asked them, can I have a drawdown of my, I'll just call a number, $500,000, so that I could pay off my house and buy a boat? Because I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm still working, but I'm over 65. And the insurance company, as the honorable member said, sir, you cannot draw down on your pension as long as you are working. And so the employer, employee says, well, listen, I am 65 years old. I'm past the retirement age. He said, it doesn't matter. You cannot have access to that money unless it's hardship or education. The, the, the gentleman says to me, Mr. Simons, it was my money. It's my money. I said, well... I hear you, I've heard this before, and it's attested by what we're putting through today, that the superannuation fund, if you're still working beyond 65, you cannot draw that until you stop working. I think that needs to be revisited, because at the end of the day, some of these people, exactly, at the end of the day, if you're working to 67, 68 years old, and you say, I wanna enjoy some of the money that I placed and saved, because how many years we have left? You know these people are dropping like flies. And so we're working to leave this pension money to the next generation? Mr. Speaker, so again, I think we need to look at that um, as far as when the pension benefits will be paid. Um, the other issue that I'd like to speak to, Mr. Speaker, is, you know, as a... a the pension funds are concerned. The minister indicated, yes, we are underfunded and things need to be done. And this, this um, extension of the pension age, sorry, the, uh, the work age is a 
recommendation that was basically touted in a number of reports. One was the SAGE Commission, they recommended it. And then a recent report that the minister, and the, I'm sorry, the, commi the parliamentary committee also recommended. So it's been around for a while, and I applaud the government for bringing it forward, Mr. Speaker. But the underfunded part, I think the other challenge that we have to address is to make sure that most of these pension plans move towards a defined contribution structure versus a defined benefit structure, because at the end of the day, those defined benefits structures are far more expensive and far more costly um, from a government perspective. And so we need to somehow look at those programs and see what transition can be made to ensure that uh, there is less of a strain on the public purse, Mr. Speaker. I mean, people don't mind making the contribution to their own pensions as long as it's being matched by their um, employer. Um, Mr. Speaker, the other issue that I'd like to speak to I'm not going to be long, Honorable Member Derek Burgess. <laughs> As I said, um, um, let me see if I do have any other issues that I wanted to raise. I think, Mr. Speaker, those are my main issues. And um, as I said, I, I support this legislation, Mr. Speaker, but we need to also address the insurance for seniors. And, oh, I know what was said, the issue of work ethic uh -huh. and, 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 a, and the commitment to, yes. to their employers. Mr. Speaker, I'll give you from personal experience. My assistant is over 60, and I am over 65. I know it's a combined age, Mr. Speaker. And we work with a mixed bag of people from varying ages, Mr. Uh -huh. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> we look at each other and say, these young people today, <laughs> these young people, they do not have the same energy that we have. In addition, if you look at the attendance record, they are out sick when they have a sneeze. We seniors walk in and come in, we have a hardly breathe and say, well, kind of get our work done. And, Mr. Speaker, that's the difference of the culture. That's the culture of our young people versus seniors. We, when we place our hearts to it, as the Honorable Member Ferbert says, it's our passion, it's our commitment, it's who we are, and we always want to put our best foot forward, and we're committed to our organization, Mr. Speaker. But some of our young people, they love what they're doing, but I am not certain that they will provide the same commitment to an organization that we have done in the past. And I'm not saying that in a, a derogatory fashion. It's just a different culture, a different mindset. So, Mr. Speaker, there are benefits to um, our seniors remaining in the workplace, and we still have a contribution to make, and we have demonstrated that we've made Bermuda better and will continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other Honorable Member be recognized as Honorable Member from Constituency 2? Honorable Member Swan, you have the floor. Yes, Mr. Speaker. I, de I, I declare my interest, as has other members in the chamber uh, before. Um, An aging with, interest? With, with a little bit of chuckle. Yes. Um, in in, in the U.S., I, I, I would be a member of AAR, qualified to be a member of AARP, uh, and in, in Bermuda, qualify uh, with all the benefits of age, con age concern. I, I just want to um, thank the advocacy of those who advocate for seniors in our community. Uh, the Honorable Derek, uh, the Honorable Member Burgess from constituency number five is one such uh, advocate, that's uh, Fierce, my colleague um, um, MP um, Tanae Ferbert is an advocate uh, for the social uh, issues as, as well in, in, in particular. I am very grateful 
to have seen the benefits of persons who are much older than, than I, having been one trained by persons who would be about 109 today. And I remember the good work that was done by a former member of the legislature in another place for uh, some 10 years, the late uh, Sir John Plowman, who in his advanced 80 years uh, convinced uh, my dear wife that rather than buy a, a bus to service justice in George's Parish rest home, it would be far better to buy one to service the entire island. And as such, Project Action was born 20 years ago uh, this year, Mr. Uh, Speaker, providing free transportation. With that advocacy and being around seniors and being uh, an employer in the workplace at the same time, um, it's, you can't help but notice, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, uh, the land-rich, cash-poor scenario that, has run, that runs rampant in, in Bermuda. And with the growing uh, your cost of living, which uh, we'll speak to um, later, uh, MP Commission speaks to very uh, well uh, as he speaks about uh, you know, the need for living wages and, and the like. Uh, many income in inequality, many uh, of our seniors uh, were, have been found themselves caught in this uh, particular um, whirlwind, whirlpool, economic whirlpool, uh, where they invested in the Bermuda Dream and have their assets in, um, in bricks and mortar and then found when the retirement age came, they had assets and lacked the, lacked, lacked the cash to sustain those assets and the much needed cash to, uh, to live day to, day to day. And as an employer, uh, somewhat around the um, turn of the century there, 1999, 90, 2000, you start seeing um, Persons who were nearing retirement age, you know, you see them working securities and, um, you know, you see seniors who would um, make a smart decision and, and buy it and buy it and buy a taxi so that they, they didn't have to put up with someone saying, I'm sorry, um, you can't, um, I can't, I can't employ you. They uh, were in control of their own uh, destiny and kudos uh, to them. But it speaks to a wider problem. And as was mentioned, as the government makes a, uh, makes a move uh, to make, provide the option for someone who wants to uh, work uh, longer, uh, I'm in favor of it not being uh, mandato mandatory and, uh, because I was certainly approached by uh, both sides of that coin. Having seen the co side of the coin that I explained um, first, uh, I did receive a call from constituents who had planned uh, their retirement for 65 and, uh, was, you know, is um, um, tiptoeing uh, ever so quickly. Um, in, in, I wasn't in the regiment, but uh, they, they referred to it as the quick step, doing the quick, the, the going the quick march towards the um, retirement and looking forward to it. And hopefully they can um, enjoy it uh, together. Uh, honorable member made mention of persons dropping like flies. Tomorrow's not promised, but you do all you can uh, to be ready for to, uh, ready for today and tomorrow, uh, in 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 hope and sure that um, you know when it comes you can face it uh, head on. And so the opportunity uh, for our seniors not to be shoved uh, out the door uh, is 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 being put in place by this government. And uh, we hope, hopefully, the private sector will follow suit. One of the things, uh, as we look at the advocacy uh, for uh, those seniors who find themselves celebrating uh, 65, is that they're no less capable if they're in managed posi management positions at 65 than they were at 64. They're no less um, knowledgeable, probably more so. Uh, at 67 than they were at 64. So those whose job doesn't depend on um, the, the, the agility of their limbs, uh, like my profession, you know, you, you let those ankles start hurting and it makes it harder for you to pivot. You make the elbows start um, hurting and it makes it 
you know, harder for you uh, to um, get the club back. And if you make the hip working, it makes it hard for the pivot. And if you have the daily trifecta, you know, you stay, you know, you limp around um, quite immobile. And so you can't you can't practice. But there are other things that you are able to do because you have those experiences. And that, Mr. Speaker, is, is something that is of great abundance in our country. And as we discussed, um, you know, in, in, an, in, another, in another debate, income in, in, inequality, we can't negate how it impacts here because in Bermuda, we do have a wealth knowledge, uh, a, a great abundance of, of intellectual capital, unused, I believe, uh, as it comes to uh, some of our, our seniors in a very field or fields that we um, require expertise, expertise and may even import it, hospitality being, being one. I see many persons who are doing some of those jobs beyond 65 and beyond 70 uh, who have a tremendous amount of uh, intellectual capital that we would, um, we would farm outside to get, to get some direction in it. And I, I, I dare say that when the day comes when we show greater uh, respect and appreciation for the knowledge pool that exists within our, within our country, uh, we would, as a people, uh, move along e even, even better uh, 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 together in that, in that regard. So I'm, I'm, very I'm very supportive, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I only hope that the uh, private sector uh, will see the wisdom of... Uh, of moving in this direction with the government, notwithstanding the, the challenges that uh, persons face um, in running uh, businesses. Uh, businesses often look uh, at the bottom line and the bottom line first and sometimes uh, foremost, but not all. Uh, there are many with a social, uh, social conscience as to how um, they uh, can best serve their, um, their employees and how their employees uh, can best serve you. There are many companies around Bermuda that have uh, employees that have been there a long, 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 long time, and that uh, 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 bodes, uh, bodes well. But as we look at the changing dynamics that have taken place in our country, those changing dynamics have um, um, had a great inf uh, effect on persons who bought into that Bermuda dream, uh, and some of the folks who uh, also find, who might not have been able to buy into that Bermuda dream, but also find themselves uh, impacted by current uh, uh, financial circumstances, uh, economic circumstances, with the uh, high cost of uh, uh, living that we have to contend with. Um, let us look to see how this legislation uh, can um, blossom and be of greater effect than what it's intended uh, in this particular instance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. No other member? Huh. Honorable Member from Constituency 10. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I guess I would say I'm a fledgling senior, so I have some uh, conflict to declare. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is uh, an important piece of legislation, and it's clear that it's unanimous on both sides of the House on the agreement to it. And, you know, in, in thinking about the debate today, it's clear that there are arguments on both sides, but this is the most appropriate way to go. And I reflected back, Mr. Speaker, on, you know, just how times have changed uh, through, uh, I guess, the last 40 years that I've been involved in the workforce, where you, you've seen how times have changed. You see how um, people now can't afford to retire early, certainly can't afford to even retire when they want to retire. Um, and I've, I've always gone by a philosophy in life, Mr. Speaker, that uh, certainly as you get older, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so it's very important um, as you start to age that you keep yourself active and healthy. And um, I think you will live a healthier life. Um, but when you look at, at what we're doing here today, and it's supported by both sides, I think we also have to recognize that there are many job functions which uh, it will be very difficult for somebody to stay in that job past the age of 65 just to, because of the stress, maybe the physical stress of what that job might do. So we're creating a, a bit of an um, unlevel playing field here because people who have a more uh, sedentary job, uh, don't move as much, can probably, as long as the health's good, can probably stay in that job um, for many years past the retirement age of 65. But those who might work in construction 
or might have very uh, strenuous jobs, uh, such as heavy truck drivers, and, and the list goes on, they will find it very difficult uh, to continue to do those jobs because uh, the more physical you get, the older you get, your bones creak, as uh, the honorable member who just finished speaking before me was referring to his profession as, as a golfer. I've always taken the approach in my business uh, through the time that I've been involved in that if somebody is capable of continuing to work and they want to work, then they can work. And um, I think it's been a great arrangement because you've seen experienced people who in their time working as they get older, they look forward to coming to work more. They have a lot to offer. They have that experience. They build up relationships not only with people in the workplace directly, but with outside the workplace. And many of those older people start to devote more attention to trying to nurture the younger people that are in the workforce as well within the company. And so I think it's a real win-win situation. Now, when to retire, Mr. Speaker, is, is, is a very tough decision. So even though we will we'll change the legislation here today and, and sometime down the road, it will be, uh, become law. Uh, that tough decision of when, when to uh, retire is certainly much more difficult than I think it has been in my lifetime. Mr. Speaker, because you cannot predict what's going to happen with the cost of living. Mm -hmm. We know that the cost of living is, is perhaps the biggest challenge faced by everyone in Bermuda at this point in time. As my honorable colleague uh, from constituency number eight referred to earlier, it's access to your pensions. Um, as the honorable member from constituency number five referred to earlier, uh, pensions in the scheme of things are a relatively new thing that's that's taken place in Bermuda. We've had the, the government pension for some time, but the private pension only came into law in the late 1990s. And so it's the ability for your, your pension to uh, carry you through your life. And then the, there's the challenges, as we've referred to during this debate, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the really high cost of health care in Bermuda and the inability to this point for us to curb that large rise in health care. And we see what happens when you become a senior, how your health care costs are going to rise because you're more apt to have uh, health care challenges, but also your insurance costs will rise at the same time. So when you decide to retire, there are a lot of things that you have to factor in. And who would have thought, Mr. Speaker, that we would be congratulating somebody in the House who lived to 105 today and is still vibrant? You know, that is becoming more and more of the life that we lead nowadays. My mother is 84, and she still lives her life like she's my age. You know, she's up and at it. She'll travel when she can. She still wants to stay involved in, in the lives of her family. She still wants to be involved in the business. She still wants to have deep conversations about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm not sharing what's going on with her, she's questioning me on it. Mm -hmm. And she's coming up with some good advice. So... I started to think back in time, my father died at 40. He never thought about a pension because probably at, those age, at that age, you're just thinking about your next steps in life. My grandfather died at 62. But now we're seeing that people are living longer and longer and longer because you pay attention to health. We have better health care, even though it's expensive. You can diagnose everything nowadays. Where you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, a lot of their diagnosis wasn't there. And so as we, we look at this debate today, we have to realize we're making a good route, a move, but it's complicated. And these decisions as you make as older people are complicated by the fact that you don't know what's going to happen down the road. So you could, you could decide, okay, you know what, I'm going to work to 70, get a little bit extra money there. But you could live a vibrant life to 100. Now, for the vast majority of people, the savings that you have put aside, your pensions that you have worked hard for in those 30 years of retirement are going to be stressed to match in Bermuda. And so while we have done a good thing here today, we really need to focus in on how do we enable people to live more productive, healthier, and um, prosperous lives, even in their sunshine years, because if, if we, we reflect briefly on some of the challenges we have in Bermuda, one of them is immigration. A lot of seniors are finding it very difficult to make ends meet in Bermuda. And their pensions, their savings will go a lot further in other jurisdictions. So while today we talk about, okay, we're going to extend the retirement age, you're allowed to work longer, and we like you in the workforce. One of the reasons why people don't want to retire is because they don't have the money to probably have to leave the country. 
And that's something that we don't want because that's a drain. That's a significant drain on people who have developed experience in Bermuda. And let's face it, the mistakes we make, we've learned from. We can help past gen the next generations to not make those same mistakes. And so today we, we talk about uh, the retirement age, and we need to have a, a bigger think. Never forget that there are m many more challenges we have to deal with this year, not only in allowing our people to work longer, and this is a good example today because I think within government, the private industry will, will follow along if they can follow along, if their business is healthy enough to allow people to continue to work here. But we have bigger challenges because eventually people are going to retire and we have to look at the fact is, can they afford to remain in Bermuda and live their lives and contribute to our society? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other Honorable Member wish to speak? We recognize the opposition whip. Honorable Member, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I certainly uh, marvel in the spirit of colleagues uh, that wish to continue to work uh, beyond the age of 65. And I certainly have to declare my interest that I'm now uh, eligible for age concern. <laughs> but I appreciate the uh, 60 being the new 40. But I need, to, I need to spend some time, though, to speak on behalf of those who are working after the age of 65 out of necessity because um, there isn't anything more challenging than looking forward to those years when you do have an opportunity to relax and find yourself in a financial crisis because uh, the cost of living has become so high that it's necessary to continue working. And because of that, um, I believe that the government has a greater responsibility beyond just uh, raising the age of, of uh, retirement, and we need to take a look at how we can support the community um, so that there is a cultural change that allows for uh, a level of, of dignity and respect during those retirement ages so that people are able to get up in the morning to go to work because that's what they want to do after the age of 65 rather than doing it um, because they have to out of necessity. There, there, in my opinion, and I'd like to know a little bit more from government, um, that there may be some confusion, too, around changing the age, that it's not just the, okay, now I can work until I'm 68, but does that, you know, can I, do I still qualify for future care? Can I ride the bus for free? Is my land tax now exempt? If, if we as a government are going to continue to provide those benefits, then I can see the real uh, opportunities and, and the real win-win uh, for uh, people who have chosen to work beyond 65. But if, if those benefits are going to be taken from them, then they're still earning the salaries that they're earning, uh, but are going to be faced with uh, the possibility that there will not be exemptions because or, or uh, beneficial uh, uh, programs of which that they uh, for which they can enroll because they are still working so uh, there there's a little more work here beside just having the increase in the retirement age I'm also curious too whether uh, the idea of second careers is out there um, if if a person does wish to maybe leave what is uh, well their long time uh, position uh, and wants to start a second job on their own, what support government is really going to give uh, to that individual that may want to get involved in something that's a little more uh, autonomous, something that, that provides uh, a little more entrepreneurship. And I'm thinking about things in particular around uh, the, the whole concept of seniors being able to stay in their homes and, uh, and retire and such and need that extra support. So are there the possibility, and I'm using this as an example, uh, situations in which, uh, in the first instance, because these will be uh, members of the public service who will be able to uh, stay at work until they're 60, 68, but would they be able to have opportunities where they might be able to work in other areas of government that allow for uh, some more entrepreneurial uh, opportunities, such as uh, supporting those who have, have retired 
and are aging at home and need that required support. And just other kinds of entrepreneurial op opportunities that may be available through government uh, or that some form of accommodation could be uh, provided to those that uh, may not want to stay in exactly the position that they're in at 65, but transfer to some other government uh, position that will allow a little more flexibility. Because one of the challenges that I do see coming down the road and is technology. So yes, absolutely, you want to stay in your job, uh, you're 65, I would imagine that there are a number of us out there in the community that are looking over our shoulders and realizing that technology is, is moving ahead very quickly and what opportunities or, or really what commitment have the sort of older working or the more mature working population, what commitments they've really taken to become more digitally savvy. And as this new technology comes into play, then are we just becoming redundant anyway uh, as we get older. So uh, that, that to me is, is a, a risk that we face. It could be a, a blind side and, uh, and I believe that the government needs to take these kinds of uh, situations into, uh, into consideration as we move forward with this cultural change. <laughs> Now, the private sector will face some pressure. Uh, if, if the public service, uh, government is uh, allowing public service to remain on the job until uh, 68, then the, public, the private sector will then have to make that consideration as well. And uh, I would like the government to be the thought leaders, to be the, uh, the, those that are committed to providing more information to having public consultation around what the private sector raising of the retirement age is going to look like. There are a number of complexities involved uh, in, in the private sector in particular that, I, that I'm aware of that need to be addressed, and I'm hoping that the government will not just tick the box at the age increase but we'll also take on the responsibility to consult with stakeholders uh, to see how this may work in the broader community. Uh, and with that, I'll take my seat. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other Honorable Member wish to speak? We recognize the Honorable Member from Constituency 19. Honorable Member, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I don't intend to um, say many things. I think um, I'm reminded of the fact that because we're talking about the superannuation fund, which is really about the, the government, we have to sometimes remind ourselves that the whole concept of, of retiring is something that, that, that we have to make sure that people um, focus on because for too long, people do not start early enough to start to talk about the fact that at some point in time, you will no longer be working and therefore you're gonna rely on your pension to take care of your needs. And so I think that we have to make sure that within government, the same as being told in, in the private sector, we have to remind people to start thinking about retirement almost from age 50. Because if you don't start to plan and understand what type of, how you live your life now, what type of debt you're, you're accumulating, what type of commitments that you're making, if you don't start understanding all of those things and recognize that that when you stop working, you're expecting that you will be able to have that same standard of living that you had before, or you'll be able to pay off those loans or mortgages, et cetera. So I think that I would hope that within government and in the private sector, we have to remind everybody that starting to plan for retirement really starts at about age 50. And I think when, when age concern allows people to be Come members of age concern at 55, it's because they are trying to remind everybody about that. Most people tend to, to get their age concern card and think, great, when I go to a supplier, I get my 10% or whatever. They don't stop and think that this is a time you have to start saying, maybe that 10% that you're getting should be starting to be put aside and start to help accumulating some of the funds that you're going to need later on when you're no longer working. So I think with respect to um, the bill that's here, 
I just want to remind everybody because I think there's a tendency to forget. Some of you might have been around long enough to remember that there used to be such a thing as early retirement. Actually, people would be living, be, people would have worked sufficiently, um, work su to for su sufficient hours in a job or at certain levels that their benefits would contemplate early retirement and therefore that that also took care of the issue as to people coming behind them and whether they were feeling that their, their, their progress was being stymied because somebody was there working forever and ever. But I think now, I don't think that I can, I, I don't think that I can count any organizations that I can think of right now that really go and talk about early retirement. And I'm talking about early retirement sort of like at the 55 years of age because I think that you know, that, that was something. So it, it's all about this issue of when you're working, what are you going to do with respect to um, contemplating that when you stop working, there will be things that, that you have to have taken care of. There will be responsibilities. And lot, too many people do not start to scale back on the, the way they live, do not scale back on, on, on their lifestyles so that by the time they they have the reduced income by the time by the time they have the reduced income uh, by the time they have the reduced income they're not able they're not able to turn around and adjust so mr speaker i i we obviously support this and we'd like to think that as we go forward people are reminded of what it's here for and we will exercise it from the point of view of of um, the benefits and the second part about it is making sure that the funds, because all the funds, when I'm talking about, not, I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about funds as a, as, as, as a, uh, a, a, a sufficient money that's there for everybody. I think it's important for us to recognize that um, this whole issue of defined benefit and defined contribution is a thorny issue out there because over time we make decisions based on defined benefits which require some assumptions and sometimes those assumptions do not do not actually result in terms of whether it be the numbers of people that are going to be in the plan, how long they're going to live, the, the investment returns, all of those things tend to um, create some difficulties later on when we have defined benefits we, we, rather than defined contributions. So, Mr. Speaker, with that, I think that um, anybody who's over 65 and wants to work longer, I declare my interest. I'm happy. I, 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 when I go into some places, the, 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 the ladies look at me sometimes, and, and one lady said recently, I don't know whether I can ask you this question. I said, I don't mind you asking me whether I'm eligible. I am eligible. I don't care that you know it. And I would like to think that most people out there who, when you get to that level, you're happy that you're alive and you're speaking to people around you. And therefore, we have to make sure that we continue to value our seniors and allow them to work as long as they want. And the superannuation fund is setting a good example. But more importantly, it was said earlier, we have to do something about the health insurance because the health insurance is the thing that is biting everybody. And, and I say that, and I have, to, I have to preface it by saying it's not just the, the health insurance because the health insurance is driven by the premiums, which is driven by the experience. And therefore, if people are not out there and able to get to their doctors and, and put money aside to make sure that their care and they take they take responsibility for their care, then it doesn't make sense that you can live longer if you don't live well. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other Honorable Member wish to speak? No. Minister? Looks like you got an opportunity to wrap up now. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'd like to thank uh, members for their overwhelming support for this, uh, this amendment. Um, I would say that this is perhaps the first step in a process uh, where we have to do some work around how we calibrate uh, or change our thinking around how we treat folks who are going to be working beyond the normal uh, retirement age of 65 years old. And the concerns around health insurance and accessing your pensions are, are obviously noted, although I will say with respect to public officers, the plans are a defined benefit. And so the pension that they have, have, uh, have, have 
have grown to uh, have in their account is something that is a liability of the government, which uh, I'm, I'm having difficulty at the moment kind of contemplating how we'd allow folks to have early access to that, but there's something certainly we, that we will look at. With that, Mr. Speaker, I move that the bill uh, be committed. Deputy, you can step up. Thank you. Members, we are now in the Committee of the Whole for further consideration of the bill entitled Public Service Superannuation Amendment Act 2019. Minister, you have the floor. Mr. Chairman, uh, this bill seeks to amend the Public Service Superannuation Act of 1991, the Principal Act, to increase the age of compulsory retirement from 65 to 68 years for certain public officers, not including police officers, fire officers, prison officers, members of the Royal Bermuda Regiment, and teachers, and to make related uh, amendments. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move uh, clauses 1 to 7. Continue. Uh, clause 1 is self-explanatory. Clause 2 amends Section 12 of the Principal Act. Currently, subsection 3 provides that a person whose first employment with the government commences after he has attained the age of 57 years shall not contribute to the fund or be entitled to any benefit under the Principal Act unless he elects to contribute to the fund. This will continue to apply to teachers. New subsection 3A increases the relevant age from 57 to 60 years for contrib contributors other than teachers in consequences of the increased age of compulsory retirement for such persons affected by Clause 3. Subsection 4 is substituted to include an election under subsection 3A and simpli simplified as former paragraph A is spent. Clause 3 amends section 22.2 the Principal Act to increase from 65 to 68 years the age of compulsory retirement for public officers to whom subsection, the subsection applies, which does not include police officers, fire officers, prison officers, members of the Royal Bermuda Regiment, and teachers. The proviso to subsection 2 is substituted to permit such officers to continue in the public service until a later age not exceeding the age of 70 years, subject to annual certification by a registered medical practitioner of the contributor's fitness to continue, and annual confirmation by the contributor's head of department to the relevant permanent secretary that the contributor is competent to discharge the, the duties of the post. Note that Section 19.1D of the Principal Act is not being amended so that persons falling within Section 22.2 are still able to retire and receive their pension at any time after age 60. Clause 4 amends Section 24 of the Principal Act by inserting new subsection 3A, which provides for automatic deferral of a contributor's pension until he ceases to be employed in the public service. For contributors falling within Section 22.2, i.e. not uniformed officers and teachers, this replaces the right to elect deferral for such persons who continue in employment after the age of compulsory retirement, which was introduced by the Public Service Superannuation Act 2007. Clause 5 amends Section 32.2 of the Principal Act. Pension to begin to accrue day after attaining age of compulsory retirement if person does not elect to defer pension until retirement under Section 24.3, so that it is no longer applies to contributors falling within Section 22.2 in consequence of the amendments made to Section 24 of the Principal Act by Clause 4. Clause 6, subsection 1, makes transitional provisions in relation to the amendment to Section 12 of the Principal Act by Clause 2. Subsection 2 specifies the person to whom the amendments to Section 24 and 32 of the Principal Act made by Clauses 4 and 5 apply to ensure the amendment complies with Section 91 of the Constitution, Constitution applicability of pension law. The date in paragraph A references the coming 
into operations of the Public Service Superannuation Fund Act 2007. Subsection 3 defines commencement date, and Clause 7 provides for commencement. Minister, it's at that time, want to move for the adjournment of lunch? Mr. Chair, I move that we adjourn for lunch until 2 o'clock. Perhaps we'll adjourn until 2 o'clock for lunch. Thank you.